Good morning and welcome to Virtual Church. It's Saturday the 14th of November. Lovely to have you with us once more. We're going on now to the third step in our series on spending time at the feet of Jesus, then being lifted up into the hands of Jesus, and finally, today, um, looking into the face of Jesus. Now, I ought to say at this point that you know, if you're dipping in and out of virtual church, or you know, sort of picking up here and there the ones that are most interesting, don't do this step if you haven't already looked at the first two steps, coming to the feet of Jesus and then being in the hands of Jesus, because this, this is a dynamic thing, it's a progression that's designed to lead us closer uh, in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord who loves us and redeems us. So um, don't just pop straight in here. Do the feet of Jesus and the hands of Jesus, our previous two virtual church services first. So look into the face of Jesus. Now, let me begin with a story. I'm sure it's a familiar story again. This is Mark's version from Mark chapter 10 at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. So there he is at the feet of Jesus, some very, very pressing need. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery. Do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's the face of Jesus, for me, that's at the heart of the story. Did you spot it? Jesus looked at him loved him. A couple of things, just in case they're a puzzle for you. Is Jesus denying that he's good? Well, he's saying only God is good. And um, he's actually there, I think, pointing to the implications of what this rich young man uh, is saying. So I don't think he's trying to deny that he's the son of God uh, and so on. In fact, he says elsewhere, don't you know me, even though I've been with you so long, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So I think Jesus is actually trying to say, think about what you're saying here. And rather than just denying uh, his divine status, he's saying, come on, think about who do you really think I am? Who are you coming to today? And the second one is, does it mean that we've all got to sell everything that we have. Uh, that Jesus doesn't spell this out as, as a rule for everyone, I think, uh, that he meets. I think on this occasion, uh, he's um, saying that, that uh, you have a problem in this specific area. These material things have too strong a hold on you, and you've got to let go before you can make room for God in your life. You've got to get rid of this idol that you're worshipping before you can really be free to worship God. So uh, elsewhere we find other things happening. Jesus doesn't demand that Zacchaeus repay everything, but Zacchaeus promises to repay those who he's defrauded. And that's, that's quite um, sufficient for Jesus uh, in, on that occasion. This occasion there's somebody who is being held back by just one thing. And Jesus is saying, time for some surgery. 
But the key verse is this. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Shall I tell you what I think is going on here? It is in Mark's Gospel. Who's going to know what was in Jesus' eyes when he uh, looked at him and loved him? Only one person, and that's the young man himself, that rich young man, saw something in the face of Jesus, didn't he? He saw that he was loved. Um, the other Gospels that have this story in, Mark and Luke, don't actually record this little phrase. I think this is Mark. Uh, we certainly find that he lived with his family in a large house in Jerusalem. And um, that's, that's perhaps a pointer to a wealthy young man. Uh, he's the only one who mentions this occasion. Maybe, just maybe, this was Mark. And there's an enigmatic young man who's just called this young man uh, later on. Uh, in the scriptures, in the Gospel of Mark. And, uh, um, so that's my thought. That's how I explain that uh, Mark knew what was in Jesus' eyes at this moment when he wrote down his Gospel. So the eyes of Jesus, the look of Jesus. There's one other Gospel occasion when this is mentioned. Uh, just the look in Jesus' eyes. And it's when Peter has denied Jesus, he's very bravely gone right into the courtyard of the chief priest's house, the place of his accusers. And um, he denies Jesus, though, under pressure. And at that point, Jesus emerges from somewhere, being led out by the guards, perhaps. And it says that he looked at him. The eyes of Jesus. But nonetheless, there is other material in the Bible that tells us something about seeing Jesus. Of course, there's 1 Corinthians 13, which says now we, we were just looking at it, weren't we, uh, in virtual church before we started this series, which says that now we see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. But we also have this uh, enigmatic statement. This is in 2 Corinthians. And it says this, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, writing this letter to the church in Corinth, seems to be saying that we as Christians have some sort of right or some sort of gift to look into the face of Christ. And this is a really important step because we've been thinking about coming to the feet of Jesus as this young man did with this overwhelming burden inside him that he couldn't find the meaning and purpose of his life. He needed to find how to get eternal life. He came to the feet of Jesus. Last time we looked at the hands of Jesus. Jesus doesn't want to leave us down there at his feet. He wants to raise us up in his powerful but gentle hands. The next step is to look into the face of Jesus. And if the first is a place of need at his feet, and the second is a place of strengthening a new life, then looking to the face of Jesus, I believe, is the place of intimacy, of worship, of closeness. It's opening up the deepest place within us to the gaze of the Lord. It's the place where we give and receive love not just because we have the need that has to be overcome, although we must do that first if we have a really overwhelming need, not just a place where we receive something like power and strength, but a place where we're known and loved and because we know that we are held in the gaze of Jesus. Well, many people find this the hardest step, 
we may well feel, we may have every reason to feel that we are not worthy, we simply aren't, to look into the face of Jesus and to have him look at us. And yet there's something in all of us, isn't it, that makes us wish that we'd been there in gospel days and we'd actually been able to look on the face of the beloved and have his face look at us. Yet he does. His face is turned towards us in love. Scripture tells us to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And many people who do this three-stage meditation with me, designed to lead us a step-by-step step into that presence of God, say they see Christ's face just as a light, the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus. So we're going to pray now, and we're going to ask for grace to be allowed to look into that beloved face. And we'll just be quiet for a few minutes and see what happens. And sometimes we may find that Jesus looks at us with acceptance, welcome, with love, because we felt rejected, we felt unwelcomed or unworthy. Sometimes he looks at us as he did, I think, in his love for this young man with a surgeon's eye, that he's looking at us wanting to to remove the things that are standing between us and him. Sometimes he looks at us encouragingly because he wants us to take new steps just as a parent looks at a young child that's taking its first steps. Well, if you've been a parent, you know that's a thing of absolute joy and delight that you look forward to so much. Maybe he's going to look at us like this. I don't know. But I'm only a vicar, he's, he's the Lord. We need to let him um, take charge now in this meditation and just see what he shows us. Be, feel free to pause this video if you need a bit more time. You might want to pause it and just go back to be at the feet of Jesus or in the hands of Jesus. And let's be still. Let's remember that he looks on us all the time. Just as a parent looks at a beloved child. Just as a bridegroom looks his heart bursting with joy at a new bride. Thank you, dear Lord, that we see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Open up our hearts to see you by faith and to know in the gaze of your eyes that you will never stop loving us. Amen. So please take this knowledge with you into this lockdown. Uh, first week was up yesterday, three weeks to go. So uh, in fact only two weeks and, and a big bit to go until um, this current phase is over. Just be sustained by the knowledge that the Lord is watching over you and he's doing it 
because he cares about you and loves you. Tomorrow our service will be going out from St Andrew's Church and I uh, look forward to seeing you on virtual church then. So God bless you and keep you and see you soon.